resources here at Watec. Um, this this uh, tech talk is going to be recorded, so please do your best to uh, stay on mute uh, to the best of your ability. Uh, if you have questions, as always, put them in chat, right? I've got a slew of smart people um, that are going to be monitoring that, that the chat queue and be responding. Um, so, you know, we, we bring the best when we do these tech talks. So this is the second uh, of our series. You might see the name Internet Strikes Back, right, for those Star Wars fans. Um, the first one we talked about uh, SD-WAN and how Watec, uh, the technology about SD-WAN and how Watec was, you know, considering it. And this tech talk is going to be, it is SD-WAN, but the focus is going to be Internet. Because SD-WAN, right, its underlying transport is, is broadband Internet. Um, and we, in eight and a half years with, with the state now, a lot of people I'm kind of surprised that are really uh, apprehensive about using the Internet, right? We, we know it's unsecure. It's the wild, wild west. But it is a cheap and effective way to get from point A to point Z, right? And it is the, the key to, to making SD-WAN work. Uh, within uh, Watex digital ecosystem and the the wide area network that supports all of state government. Um, so this one's going to be internet. Um, we brought we brought the best from Watex. Um, Andrew Johnson, the principal architect, uh, he's a solutions architect leading up the SD WAN effort. Uh, he's going to talk about the internet here, um, and he's going to tell you all the great things that it can do. Right. Um, we, you know, if there's one good thing that COVID brought about is when everybody went home, the internet service providers had to upgrade all their infrastructure um, because they just didn't have the capacity, right? When everybody was working in the offices, whole different, but when everybody jumped on the internet, right? All the ISPs in the Pacific Northwest, right? All the major ones upgraded their infrastructure. So it opened up a lot of capacity. Um, now, Watec, just to, to, to caveat where we are, um, we've, we have settled on Cisco Viptela, which is the, uh, the SD-WAN technology that we are adopting. Um, we're in the final stages of uh, finalizing a consultancy scope of work uh, to, to get help to uh, do the initial system build. We're doing five sites. That was approved as part of the pilot. Um, so some of your agencies, some of you will probably be involved in our pilot. Um, we're, we have a project manager that's been requested, so we're waiting on that project manager to show up, right? Um, but we're, oh boy, since my boss is on the call, I got to be careful. But the goal, target, right, is we're hoping to have the, uh, the SD-WAN pilot with five sites uh, completed by the end of this calendar year. Um, if all goes well, we will have uh, five, up, five sites running, and then we can start you know, start the 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 role of bringing people on SD WAN. Um, so for a lot of you, please don't get scared. SD WAN is not a scary thing. It's an absolutely great thing, right? Um, I went into that going, you know, getting older. We don't ah, we don't want to do that. Well, we do, and there's a lot of reasons why. And as part of these tech talks, right? That's what we're here to educate state government about. Um, so the third one which is will be, I think, in March or April. I'm not sure. Andrew hasn't told me when to schedule it. Um, that's going to be how we intend to leverage SD-WAN, and it's going to be a lot more about the pilot. Um, so please bear with us. And then following today, once this is done and the recording is, is, is um, finalized, uh, I'll do a reply all once it gets put up on Watex Tips and Tricks Security. I think it's a YouTube, Watex YouTube page. And I'll put that link out so you can forward it to to those that didn't make today. But uh, without further ado, uh, I'm going to turn this over to Mr. Andrew Johnson, Watex Principal Architect, uh, supporting SD WAN. Take it away, Andrew. All right, thank you, Mike. Um, so you stole some of my thunder, but that's all right. Repetition is key to understanding, so it's a. Uh... All good here. So um, I'm looking at the date on here and I just can't believe it's 2023 when you talked about getting old. Um, <laughs> so I uh, here's my obligatory agenda slide. Um, so um, uh, again, the repetition is, is the key. You're going to hear me repeat myself a little bit. Um, it's uh, it's not because I have a, a short term memory problem. Um, and 
I got an obligatory disclaimer as well. Um, not every site is going to work with SD-WAN. Um, I don't know when or where uh, that's true and where it's not true. Um, right now, uh, each location has got to be assessed for viability uh, and carrier availability at each particular location. Um, and then also, uh, as our uh, statewide cloud adventure continues, um, there are going to be refinements and enhancements to these designs that we're going to talk about. Uh, so just keep that in mind. Um, because what is true today may be old school in a couple of years. Uh, this this tech is changing very quickly. Um, we uh, um, were uh, allowed to uh, talk one on one with Cisco, uh, Mike and myself uh, here back in November, and already uh, when the pilot concluded in June, for example, or not the pilot, but the uh, proof of concept uh, concluded in June, there was already code uh, revisions and updates that made some of the uh, findings. Um, Kind of irrelevant, which uh, was is a it was a good thing to be honest with you. Uh, some of the things we had problems with had been fixed, so um, it was uh, it's good to see. So that well, I imagine will continue to be the trend here. Um, one of the things uh, you know, we're going to talk about, I'm going to recap a couple of the slides that you saw from the last one. If you saw it, please bear with me. Um, if you uh, if you didn't see it last time, uh, this will be a quick review. But if uh, you did miss episode one, uh, it is like Mike mentioned, hung on the uh, LaTeX page. Uh, take a take a chance to go back and take a look at that. Um, and then the concept of operations is uh, is the phase where we're really nailing things down right now, and uh, we're wanting to share that with you. Again, focus be in the internet, and I'll go into why uh, as the next set of slides ensue. So uh, this should take a little over an hour. I'll leave you some time to uh, some Q and A, uh, and let's let's get this thing moving. All right. So uh, what's SD WAN again? Um, what what is that? Uh, all right. So. Um, um, SD, SD-WAN's new, and I think it's safe to say that no one here has used it. Uh, so I, I want to spend a few minutes rehashing some of what we discussed in episode one. Um, it, again, I just, uh, I've, I'm stealing my own thunder here. <laughs> so I've got a little script. Um, SD-WAN is a transformational wide area technology um, that uh, leverages specialized software uh, to permit secure routing directly between branch sites, cloud service providers, on-premise data centers, company headquarters, et cetera. Uh, that software takes away much of the thinking functions of the routers and provides a centralized administrative system to control them all. Um, SD-WAN is transformational in the aspect that it is intended to optimize traffic flows and is built with an emphasis on consuming cloud services. Uh, the real benefit of these systems is the optimization of the branch offices. Uh, and I'm going to bang on that one a couple of times while we go through this. Um, and plain speak, uh, a branch site may no longer need to route through a central site like the SDC before heading off to the cloud. It, and it can take a secure path and based on policy, uh, which can be set up down to a specific application. Uh, conversely, it can be forced through a, a specific security checkpoint if that is deemed necessary, uh, but that'll be uh, dependent on the topologies and the needs of each individual agency. Um, the system is customizable to that kind of degree. Um, hopefully that little nugget intrigues the audience to stick around, um, but uh, today I'm going to focus and still keep it at high level, even though these are tech talks, uh, this is a, a massive subject, uh, and uh, I don't want to give Cisco a shameless plug, but there are training resources available uh, from Cisco that you can uh, that you can uh, dig into if you're interested in, uh, in getting your team spun up. Um, you guys as the customers don't necessarily have to worry about that so much because Watek's going to run the SD-WAN, uh, but it's still good to know what's uh, happening, um, you know, one one step away from your edge router. All right, this was from the last um, the last uh, slide deck, um, the episode one, um, and um, we've got several terms here that have existing meanings. Um, it's important to note that since SD-WAN is transformational, some of the common terms may have been reused or have uh, earned some new or updated meanings. Um, take, for instance, the VPN uh, up there towards the, the top. Um, I almost immediately think of individual tunnel links on a router, uh, like VTIs and things like that, um, uh, you know, used to build two connections between two sites. Um, uh, but in the construct of SD-WAN, the VPN is the entire topology. So uh, that is the, the naming convention Viptela uses for the virtual network. Um, in the SD-WAN environment, uh, the VPN is the design and the build of uh, a network using as many VTIs as needed. Um, there are a few terms you're going to hear repeatedly, so let's just get them cleared up now. 
Uh, SD-WAN builds an overlay network or a VPN, uh, and that is the logical peerings between participating nodes. That overlay rides atop the underlay network. The underlay uh, can be any transport. Uh, we're really wanting to focus on the internet, but any transport. And the intention is to reduce focus on how the transport connectivity is built and shift that focus to where a handoff to your site uh, exists, uh, you know, directly to an internet provider. Uh, and, and that uh, overlay then can form on top. Uh, we don't really have to worry about all of the the ins and outs of what's in between uh, the SDC and your remote site, for example. Uh, so this really should remove, reduce much of our uh, design work. Uh, the best part about shifting that focus off of the underlay uh, is that you no longer have to build an A side and a Z side. Now you just need to establish a connection to the internet and it will carry the traffic to wherever the other overlay nodes are. Uh, the underlay can be any transport type, again, uh, as long as it has reachability to the other carriers, uh, which is one of the principal fu uh, functions of the internet, right? Connecting multiple service providers uh, and, and a big backbone. Um, so that's kind of a given. Um, each overlay uh, VPN maps to an agency's VRF uh, in the existing architecture, and it's that linkage that allows the SD-WAN nodes and our non-SD-WAN sites to, uh, or, or legacy sites to intercommunicate. Again, not every site will be SD-WAN capable. Um, it is, uh, but they've got to work together. So it's uh, it's that uh, mapping that makes make sure that that happens. Um, we will really dive into the topic in the following Tech Talk series. Uh, you're not going to learn about configuration scripts or anything like that today, uh, but uh, just the, the the big key pieces of what our our concept uh, and and plans moving forward look like. So in Viptela, the individual VPN is identified only as a number, where in our MPLS environments, uh, a lot of you are familiar with, you know, the MPLS VRF is named. Uh, typically, it's your name dash core, your agency name dash app, so on and so forth, right? Um, we're going to map your uh, VPNs to your agency code, uh, the OFM agency code that you guys are all assigned. And that way, we can do a one-to-one do -one mapping. Um, the SD-WAN is not a MPLS aware system, so uh, we've got to tie it together somehow. Uh, and it's uh, just simple little things like that that, you know, can can get things complicated if we don't sort them out in the in the earlier phases. And then finally, the red colored items here are the focus. Uh, so we'll get to those on their own dedicated slides. So. All right, this is also from the uh, first episode, but I really like this slide. I think it's important that we understand this because in the community that we're all in, we all have a variable uh, understanding of what software defined means. And uh, there's enough of those variations that we could probably spin in circles around for a long time. Uh, so let's just make sure that we all understand there's some things here like this doesn't replace your employees. This stuff uh, doesn't, uh, uh, it's not just an easy button. There's, you know, it's not artificial intelligence that's doing networking for us. It, th those are myths. Um, so uh, and uh, these are these are straight off the the uh, the Internet. So you can you can find uh, plenty more where these came from uh, if you were curious. All right. So. Um, it's another slide from episode one. I got probably three more. Um, uh, I don't read slides to you, so let me just tell you what the so what part of this slide is. All right. Well, text, like Mike said, is getting ready to uh, deploy out a pilot environment for our SD WAN. Uh, the, in, the initial deployment is pretty small in scale. Uh, it consists of five remote locations uh, the Azure Cloud and both of the state data centers. Um, equipment procurement is underway. Uh, the ink is still wet on our contracts. We're still going through statements of work with Cisco and uh, Worldwide Technologies, who's our contractor helping us out with uh, getting this stuff uh, deployed properly. Uh, and some of the, I'm still working on some of the final uh, systems engineering management plan documents and uh, some of the, the refinements of the high level design transitioning from the uh, proof of concept designs to the actual pilot designs. Because when we did the POC, it was done in the lab environment. Uh, the pilot's obviously going to be in production. So, um, the pilot test includes a mix of, uh, of the different sites and the connectivity types uh, and the use cases. You'll see those here in just a minute on another slide. Um, one site's going to have more than one agency, uh, so we're going to you know, build two agency uh, networks at that location, two different uh, overlays. One site's going to have an LTE slash 5G uh, capable antenna uh, to, and, a, and a broadband internet connection. 
uh, to, you know, and bring in those test cases and uh, validate that that stuff will work. So obviously, you know, they've got to have proximity to some nice cell, cell signal uh, capability, right? Um, and then one of the sites, uh, or I'm sorry, all of the sites that have it are going to keep their dedicated Ethernet connection that they have today, um, but we're going to add on the broadband service. That's the, the general idea behind the pilot test out as many of the use cases as we have defined uh, in, a, in an actual production environment with the guinea pig agencies. I mean, the test agencies that are uh, uh, volunteering to help us out with this. So um, we're refining some of the design details with Cisco. Uh, as I mentioned a minute ago, they've rolled out some enhancements to their code base and um, there's some additional features that are on the roadmap that are really exciting, but I'm not going to cover those today. I just want to let you know there's some there's some pretty nifty stuff on the horizon for for this uh, this product. All right, <clears throat> so um, um, again, repetition is 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 the key. So just hang with me. Um, a lot of this stuff is is reiterative. Um, but SD WAN is an edge service, and uh, Watec remains responsible for its operations and maintenance. That's that's period. Um, however, with some of the features that are available here, SD WAN overlays and pol policy manipulation can be delegated down to the agencies. Uh, so that's that's a big change in the way we do things today. Um, agency IT staff can be granted permission to access only your overlay and to have function uh, capabilities where you can change your traffic prioritization for one app over another QoS functionality, um, you know, giving you guys a little bit more control of what your WAN does than you're traditionally used to here. Um, we still have to keep uh, accidental missteps from affecting other agencies, uh, ergo LaTeX maintaining the, the, the ultimate control of what the WAN does. So uh, when it comes to the cloud, uh, SD-WAN edge nodes can connect into Azure's vWAN hub. Uh, they can connect into uh, traditional hub vNets uh, as an NVA or a network virtual appliance. Um, they can connect into AWS's transit gateway um, and enable all that same uh, segmentation of networks and uh, the direct routing between the clouds, uh, similar to what we do today. Uh, but they're literally bolted on you can buy these things right out of the marketplace um, on on both of those providers um, it is available in other clouds but uh, for the most part i don't think any other agencies are really consuming like google cloud or uh, oracle or or any of the others at the moment um so the uh, additional capabilities exist within Viptela to, to serve as the hub component, um, where thereby kind of replacing the need to even use those VWAN hubs or transit gateways. Uh, that is one of the things we're looking at during the pilot, because that could actually be a, a nice uh, a nice feature, because it could simplify some of the interrouting between all the different segments. Um, but uh, that's one of those feature enhancements that's that's more recent than the POC. Um, so, but the bottom line of the why I'm talking about these different uh, hub components of the system is there's likely to be a blend of all three flavors uh, in the beginning because of the the uh, kind of the disjointed effort to driving towards the cloud and all the variable uh, cloud environments that are are there and the you know the the folks that haven't done the cloud onboarding yet will, will you know, kind of lay into the SD-WAN as its future is intended, but we'll still make sure that we bolt this thing into the environments that it applies, um, you know, with, without complete destruction of your environment. <laughs> we'll save that for another day. So, and that's a joke, by the way. Um, <laughs> so, um, all right. There are capabilities to support community cloud designs, but those are going to require a review of an architecture um, and integration with that community um, and uh, and Watec to make sure that we route it properly. So um, there's a lot of things we can do. There's a lot of things that we have to make sure that we are able to do and ready to do. Uh, just because you can turn something on doesn't mean you should, right? And we got to make sure we design those blended things together properly. And I could think of a couple of uh, key agencies that have brought those kinds of uh, interests up. We're, we're, we're here, yeah, we're thinking about you. Uh, I'll keep your name out of the limelight now uh, for the time being, though. So the intended design as of now is that like, SMON connected sites uh, remain as they are, and uh, the headquarters picks up the access to your SD-WAN uh, overlay at the State Data Center or Quincy Data Center. Um, uh, these um, the, the systems are... Um, 
are scaled to accommodate uh, a huge number of SD-WAN overlays, uh, the head ends at the state data centers, and you're already wired to the SDC if you're on the SMON, um, and you, with with pretty serious capacity at that. So the, the intention is really not to replace an SMON edge router with an SD-WAN router. Um, that just becomes a uh, a financial burden. And one of the big key points about SD-WAN is it is meant to you know, pay for itself uh, as we modernize the network and deploying out uh, edges at every building in the Capitol campus is, it just skyrockets the price tag. Um, so the, so just keep that in mind, but it doesn't mean you can't. Um, electrically, we can do anything uh, that you can probably put your mind to. So, you know, the, the we would have to analyze that stuff. Kind of a disclaimer here. We just want to make sure that, uh, uh, we set reasonable expectations. Again, this stuff transform, uh, transforms and modernizes the way your branch offices, your remote sites talk, uh, and optimizes your workloads for the cloud versus uh, a like-for-like -like trade of, of existing gear for new gear. That's, it's, that's not the intention. All right, and I think that's all for this slide. All right, so pictures. All right, so this is a conceptual diagram, uh, and its uh, intention is to show the integration of a couple of different site types um, on a couple of uh, agency overlays. So you see agency codes 550, 10, or 1050, and 0130 up there. Uh, that that actually is a couple of whoever you guys are. I just randomly picked some numbers off the OFM website. But this kind of shows you the topology differences from one site to the next. Um, the SD-WAN integrates with the cloud. As I mentioned, it bolts into the, the cloud service providers. The uh, uh, Viptela folks have made sure that their product aligns with and, and works with Azure and AWS. So we can, you know, continue to buy Cisco and, you know, they'll be happy and we'll be happy and everybody's happy. Um, <laughs> anyway, uh, it is a good thing uh, considering the uh, the state of our collective cloud approach. Again, we're we're, all over the place with with designs. We need a flexible solution, and for now, uh, I'm going to keep these diagrams kind of theoretical. Um, I, I don't want to go too far into uh, one particular agency's uh, bailiwick because the second I do that, I've got to make a whole bunch of other diagrams to show every single possible type of topology. Just know that the ground truth here is that each overlay, uh, represented by a different color here, is customizable to an agency's locations. But if we can Double up and leverage um, uh, a multi, you know, a, a router at a location, just like we do today with PE router deployments. If if we want to deploy out an SD WAN box that can support DSHS and HCA at the same location, I don't know if that place exists, but if it does, we want to be able to do that. Uh, this thing can be virtualized uh, uh, to that point. And then, um, let's see. Um, the green lines on the right here show uh, the control and the management planes. I'm going to dig into the data plane versus the uh, control plane stuff here. You, you, you know, checking my, my cursor there, um, probably wiggling it on the wrong screen. Um, the the control and the management plane uh, is all that uh, that magical stuff that happens in the background, all the under the hood. Uh, jazz that Viptela does. Uh, it is, uh, but it's it's. It starts to get really complicated when you try to draw all the different uh, traffic types that happen with this. But really, what what it comes down to is you get a couple of controllers. They do their thing with the green lines, and I didn't mean to rotate my screen. Sorry about that. And the control connectivity and the management connectivity uh, is off to the side, kind of out of band, if you will. And then the data plane is your actual data path, your your traffic flows between sites. So when I say participating sites. You know, their their devices like this representation of an SD WAN router, where at this site uh, there's not a lot going on. I should have deleted these two lines. I didn't catch that. Um, but this would only be, you know, servicing overlay 550 plus the management plane. Um, but this site would be servicing a couple. Uh, and this is great because that's value added uh, designs. Um, so. Um, and again, each agency is going to vary. Um, uh, so this intends to just show you that singular view with a couple of networks. Um, and I'm going to go ahead and move on, I think. So 
Uh, well, hang on before I before I do. Uh, so for those who are not in the cloud yet, OK, so what if you're not there? OK, no worries. We'll just take you off the diagram. Um, no, but in all seriousness, uh, the vManage controller um, and I'm going to talk about each controller individually. Uh, and, and since we did pick Viptel, I'm going to focus on their actual names. So the, the vManage controller can and does automate uh, deployment of SD-WAN nodes and connections in the cloud. Uh, so if or when it is time for you to bring in a SD-WAN connection to a cloud, uh, those connections can be provisioned very similarly to the way we would deploy a real piece of hardware to a branch office site in Spanaway. Um, the serial numbers that come with the virtual appliances uh, also link to Cisco's smart account that Watech will manage. Um, the same exact way that a real appliance does. A, and in the dashboard, they show up no differently. You, you, you can barely tell the difference between a real router and a, and a cloud provisioned router. Um, whether they're in Vancouver, Spokane, it doesn't matter. If it, it, they, they look the same. Uh, that, single, uh, that single dashboard is, is really, uh, is really a, a nice feature of this system. Uh, but I'll, more on that in a few minutes. Um, so, Really what you're looking at here is the tenancy model. Um, we'll go into that just a little bit. Um, Watek maintains control of the data plane, to, or I'm sorry, maintains control of the control plane today uh, for all of the routing that we do on all those MPLS VRFs that we have. Uh, this is gonna remain the case with SD-WAN. Um, so where SD-WAN really shines is those agency defined topologies, your routing policies, and those delegated permissions to your individual teams. Um, so the, the colored lines here, the blue, the yellow, and the purple ones, if these are yours, uh, you can you know, have the, the admin rights enough to you know, kind of tune and tweak what those, what those do um, and limited uh, use of what you're gonna do with the green, the green lines, that control plane stuff. Um, but that keeps the uh, infrastructure uh, simple. Uh, in comparison to what it could be considering the, the makeup and the hierarchy of how the state of Washington's networks are all set up. Okay, so some inherent traits here. I've got these top lines here bold printed. You can see internet's bold print because again, you keep hearing me say the word internet. This, it is critical that we understand the importance of where the internet fits into this. Um, so this is also a slide from, uh, from deck uh, one, but, uh, uh, and, and I, I don't know, to me, it seems like it, this is a true statement. Uh, I know it is, uh, you know, I've been working on SD-WAN for going on three years now, maybe a little longer at this point. Uh, but I, I suspect it's going to take us a while to kind of adjust our thought process on what we've come accustomed to in the past with the way we design and deploy networks. Um, and uh, the main idea here is that we stop worrying about how circuits are engineered and instead just get a site connected to something that is connected to everything else. Uh, hopefully that Tongue tongue twister wasn't uh, wasn't too much, you know. We just connect to somebody that connects to everyone else. So if we can get that going, that saves us a lot of work. Uh, let the software configuration in the controllers do all the hard stuff. You know that that's really the kind of takeaway. So I'm going to repeat this time and again. Uh, this this may be a perfect solution for one site and not appropriate for another. It really is going to vary on what the availability of those different carriers look like at each location, because you can't just assume that something is there and ready for you. Um, we will have to weigh uh, all of those things as we approach your migration. Um, our EDN team at Watech will have a cool little checklist of all of the, the Q&A things that they need to say as a result of our pilot process. So uh, when we get ready to do these analyses, we, we can and you know, hopefully deploy them out uh, as quickly as we possibly can. All right, so let's define the parts. Okay, so SD-WAN controllers, all right, the magic in the software defined network is the controller and the code base that runs on the machines that interact with those controllers. Abstraction is the key word here. Um, this is the removal of specific processes or functions on a network device and relocating it to a central system. In Viptela, there are three types of controllers uh, where each one is responsible for one or more of the communication planes in the system. The abstraction of the management control and data planes optimizes communications across the system. Um, with SD-WAN, there is an additional plane, the orchestration plane, which normally is just a manual process of bringing up a new node. Um, we 
all should understand what that looks like by now, I presume, unless you're new to IT, then uh, forgive me for assuming. But uh, if you've been here, you know, a while, that there's nothing new about that. Uh, but it, the best part about this is that this new plane, this new controller that handles that plane, uh, gives us an apparatus to automate much of that process. Uh, ergo, the new plane. All right. Um, so this principle applies to the WAN just as it would for any other controller-based infrastructure. If it were wireless LAN controllers or network, network access control systems or emerging tech that you might find if you're reading about Secure Service Edge or SSE applications. And that's the only plug I'm going to give you for SSE today. So if you're looking for more of that, uh, you'll have to wait for another day. Traditional routers uh, only have the view of the world as they see it by their own operational interfaces and the databases that they use to make forwarding decisions. All right. Um, there is no awareness of the network at large, even in uh, protocols like OSPF or EIGRP, where link state databases or topology tables exist. Um, they are very self-centered, so to speak. Uh, so to help them get over themselves and to help us have a better performing network, these software defined controllers uh, take over the planes listed here and particular servers control those planes, uh, removing the one-sided view of the network. So an analogy for you. Uh, think about how we see the world when we're driving the car. Um, we get on, we get to an intersection, we have to make a decision about which way to go. And we do this every single time we get to an intersection, right? You have no idea what's happening at the next one when you're sitting at the current one. Uh, so now the controllers can see all of that from up above. They can see all the paths, know if there's a performance issue on one particular path, the state of each path at all times, if they're latent, jitter-filled, got a bunch of packet loss, the controllers already see this. They know this. They're, they're maintaining uh, constant uh, observation of that. And that maintains an overall view of the network that is fed to the routers. Uh, this allows packet forwarding processes to just work at the actual routers. So in short, the decisions have been made for them. Um, the controllers communicate with the edge routers, uh, or the actual term is V-Edge, but uh, we'll get into that in a sec. Um, and uh, for, the, for their intended purpose, uh, each, each controller uses secured links to, uh, uh, so that the policies that we create and uh, can influence the network performance. Uh, this, coupled with built-in security feature sets, allows for optimal internodal communications from each site meaning that we can enable inspection, awareness, and routing straight from remote office to the cloud or other remote offices without having to return to a centralized control point, unless you want it to, of course. You may have a, a audit requirement or some other thing like that that some device has to sniff your traffic. Hey, so what? We can, we can put that into the design. Uh, we just need to have that conversation as this gets closer to the horizon. Um, so uh, there may still be a use case for all of that centralized stuff, um, uh, but with uh, but it is customizable per agency. So again, we're going to discuss more of those details later. So edge routers um, uh, code is actually SD WAN built. Uh, so not just any device will do. You can't just use any old random uh, random router off the street. You got to have SD WAN capable machines. Um, but th it is this software construct that allows all that magical stuff in the background to happen. Um, that that controller and that that device and their SD WAN code base uh, they work uh, simpatico with each other. So now am I telling you that you have to manage 10, 27, 245 site policies and firewall rule sets? Yes and no. Um, the configuration is done for all of this in one spot. Uh, so while you can tweak each site specifically if needed, uh, you only have to touch the centralized control point, uh, that is the vManage, uh, so the complexity there is significantly reduced. Uh, or at least that's what the Cisco sales guy says. Um, no, in real life, we, we tested all that stuff out, um, and it, it actually delivers as advertised. Um, so if there was, if it were any other way, this solution would have never made it off the ground. Let's, let's just be for real. So let's go ahead and introduce you to the various controllers. So, and where they sit. So this is a picture from the last one, um, but, uh, and it's, it's not my diagram. Uh, I think we, we stole this off of Cisco's website, I believe. Uh, just kind of give you a general topology. And, you know, the fun fact is MPLS VPN here, that's us. That's that's Watek. Um, so it's a little different in our case. It's not just a pass through because, as we all know, you have to go through the SDC today to get to 
where you're going because it's also the security perimeter, right? It's not not your typical state data, or it's not your typical data center uh, design where it's just a site where you go get your stuff. Um, but uh, it's important to note that the MPLS network that your remote sites use today are no longer MPLS once the SD-WAN site is stood up. Uh, the SD-WANs uh, and the SD-WAN routers do not participate in MPLS uh, layer distribution protocol, and they don't establish layer three uh, VPNs like the PE routers do. Uh, that's a multi-protocol BGP thing that MPLS is uh, known for. Um, this, this stuff replaces that. Um, the VPN configuration, for each overlay is mapped again to your existing MPLS VRF, and that's so we can integrate the new with the old. Uh, that'll be incredibly important during that initial phase. Uh, someday down the road, if 100% uh, MPLS is uh, gone, who knows what the future looks like in that case? I mean, it could be SD WAN 100%. That'd be that'd be awesome. Uh, the SDC would be just a place. Um, but uh, I'm not going to dig into MPLS fundamentals at this time. Um, uh, but uh, when we dive into how a site is built in later talks, it'll it'll make sense. You, you'll you'll see what I mean. Um, so as mentioned earlier, uh, the main takeaway here is a controller infrastructure, uh, and it's primarily built with the cloud, uh, or it's primarily built in the cloud. I'm sorry, um, with the rationale being that the site converts to a broadband internet connection, or LTE 5G, both combination thereof uh, and the internet is ad is advancing uh, the cloud adoption um, so then it makes more sense to leverage cloud-based controllers than relying on the SDC um, if if I'm connecting your branch office to the internet why not just use that path to get to a controller that sits out in the internet uh, securely of course for my OCS friends um, each overlay is customizable. I'm going to say it again and again and again um, to each agency's needs. And uh, if a star topology is desired, so be it. If a full mesh is desired, that's cool too. Uh, if a mix and match of both is preferred, that too is supportable. So it, it, it is really customizable to what it is that you need. So if you're DOL and you've got 200 plus sites and you uh, need 65 of them to be able to talk to each other and they can't talk to anybody else, you can set that up. Um, you just got to probably have a nice diagram so you understand what you're trying to build to. Um, the most important th thing to remember is that branch site modernization uh, still requires analysis, planning, and standardization for scalable deployments and optimal traffic flows. Uh, this is not an easy button that just makes everything simple. I wish it were. Uh, it's still networking. It still has to be done deliberately. Um, there are design considerations to keep in mind when planning the migration of a site to the SD-WAN. Uh, the variations in layout, equipment speed, port types, connectivity options, um, uh, you know, used directly uh, equals how many templates we may need. That is, uh, that, that could be a little bit uh, sketchy uh, if, if we are all over the place with, uh, with standards. So uh, standardization is going to be really, really important. Um, uh, the more standardized a site build is, the more likely a template can apply across multiple sites. <clears throat> uh, in short, template sprawl becomes a concern um, if uh, we don't want to have 1,200 templates with 1,200 sites, you know, if, if you know what I mean. So having said that, uh, I discovered in November that a new there's a new code release for the Viptela product that changes that paradigm. So my my Gut reaction right now says concern myself with template template sprawl, uh, but Cisco assures us that they have fixed the template sprawl problem. Um, we'll see when the pilot is finished if that is true or not, um, and and how much they have actually tuned and tweaked that. But it has me hopeful because that was probably one of my number one drawbacks to the Viptela product. Uh, to be completely clear with you. All right, so. V manages the controller where the user interface lives. Um, I think we all know what GUI means, so um, you know whatever. Um, in normal IT speak, it is the network management system, plain and simple. Um, it manages the the network for the SD WAN fabric. Uh, it is the single point where the operator interacts with every single piece of the SD WAN. Uh, this is the graphic user interface that we will use to do everything, see the status of everything, and troubleshoot almost everything. 
I say almost because we still find a time where we have to go and look at the lights and make sure that you have your networks advertised from the customer side router to the Watec router and vice versa, right? It's it's uh it doesn't see every single piece of the topology. It can't see your LANs, for example. But uh, when it comes to troubleshooting the WAN, this is the one thing you're going to log into. Um, the controllers sit outside of the system's overlay. There are two VPNs or, or overlays uh, that are uh, for the management and the control traffic. That's VPN 0 and VPN 512. Um, those cannot be changed. That is, that is just the numbers. That was those green dotted lines that were on the side of that picture I showed you. So um, it is uh, it is in these two networks that all of the under the hood stuff occurs. Um, that's where Watech's going to do all of the things that Watech does, and the policies that you guys influence will be communicated over those networks. Um, and your data plane, all of your uh, site to site stuff, will do what the site to site stuff does based off of what you tell it to do. Um, so what you get in sorts is an out of band network uh, that is built in uh, as part of the operating system. Um, Viptela can support up to 65,536 overlays, but thank goodness uh, we only need a couple of hundred because uh, uh, that would just be unreal to think of that many possible topologies out of a couple of devices. But if you needed to grow one, you certainly can. Um, and like you see here on the slide, if the vManager shut off, the system will survive. Uh, it is only needed to add or change uh, the existing system. So in short, you're going to have to wait until it comes back up if something were to go wrong with it uh, to be able to add anything or get anything done. Um, but uh, the vManage, and here's, here's just, a, I'll just get all the ugly stuff right up front. The vManage is not in an HA system. It does not have a backup partner. Uh, it can, but they're not active active. Uh, this may sound scary at first, uh, understandably, but it is literally designed to work this way. Um, a backup system can go into the network, but it's got to be brought online similar to way you would promote a uh, domain controller uh, in the failure of a primary. So um, it's, it's not intended to have a backup. Uh, the reason for that is we need a, a solitary singular source of truth for what that configuration for the system looks like. And uh, we don't want to have a accident where we've been programming stuff in A and B and they don't match. So that's not even it's not even a possibility. So uh, because we're working towards the end state where the Internet is the primary transport option, we want to see the vManage sitting in the cloud. I already said this, but again, repetition is key. Um, uh, it's, I, I, it seems to make sense that it can leverage the flexibility of Azure and the ease of reachability that they have. We can get to them from any place, from any internet provider. We don't have to think about it. Um, the vManage can stay privately addressed uh, in the IP scheme, uh, but that presents access concerns. We would have to make sure that certain overlay capabilities were available. Um, so what we'll end up doing instead, we'll, we'll hide that public IP address that it has behind some network load balancers and other Azure security components to keep it available but safe. Um, it's, uh, you know, when we did the proof of concept, we attached the, the public IP right to the machines, and within 10 minutes, we had Russian port sweeps hitting the, the cloud environment. Uh, and I'm not even kidding, 10 minutes. So I had to put a geofence policy in the network security group. That was one of the first things I had to do. Uh, it's not what I expected to have to focus on. So uh, we will not replicate that going forward. All right, so additionally, uh, vManage runs uh, application program programming interfaces, APIs, for those that aren't familiar yet, um, that can automate the add-on of new cloud components. Dur and during our testing, I was able to spin up a vWAN hub uh, routing between the vWAN hub and a spoke vNet and the associated uh, parts that go with all of that in about seven minutes through the vManage GUI, um, where when uh, Larry, my uh, my my our network engineering supervisor and I were working on this uh, manually. We did it both ways. It still took all day to build this stuff in the cloud. Um, so that API uh, was was really nice to see, and that applies to uh, uh, AWS as well. Uh, they just do it just a hair different, but all intents and purposes, I log on to the vManage. I, I have a cool little chart that says make this overlay talk to that one or don't let that one talk to this one. And everything was over but the crying. It, it again took less than 10 minutes. So um, 
SD-WAN devices register by serial number, um, and they use a built-in uh, certificate in their TPM module um, that uh, is what allows the device to only communicate with LaTeX owned and operated systems. That is one of the principal components and 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 ideas behind this the sanctity and the security of this system. If you didn't get bought by LaTeX uh, and you're not registered to that smart account I mentioned a little while ago, you're not coming into the overlay. So it's as simple as that. And if we forgot to add it during the purchasing process, that's okay. We'll have to go back in there and add it because we ain't talking to you, bottom line. Uh, but we'll talk about that when we get to talk about orchestration. So um, vSmart is one of a couple of controllers that are going to work, uh, and they serve as uh, BGP route reflectors for all intents and purposes. If you are uh, cloud enabled already, you may have heard the term route server. Uh, it's a Azure term they use. Uh, that is what a route reflector is. Uh, we use them today in the MPLS underlay uh, to handle internal BGP communications because it scales better than the, uh, uh, the, the full mesh configuration of 200 routers worth of uh, peering. Uh, that just doesn't that just doesn't hunt, right? <laughs> so the the route reflector takes that process. The, the vSmart is no different in that regard. Um, one thing to note though, this vSmart controller and our MPLS controllers uh, are uh, route reflectors, they don't work together. That they're they're unique to, and, and separate from each other. Just uh, couldn't you just use this? No, no, we can't. Um, just in case that question comes up. So um, you do not configure the vSmart um, other than initial network connectivity. Um, as a matter of fact, you folks won't configure one of these at all. Uh, these belong to Watech. Um, these devices are going to work together between the state data centers and the cloud, and uh, they facilitate that abstraction of the control plane. They handle the exchange of IPsec crypto keys, uh, as well as the routing table information for all of the SD-WAN routers. They maintain constant communication with each other and with each of the remote routers, and they feed that routing table information um, to vManage and to the remote routers. And so when we affect policy changes, routing rules, and things of the like, uh, they make it into the system for use. So the vSmart, <clears throat> part, pardon me, the vSmarts uh, can each handle a thousand edge devices. And if these go out uh, at the same time, if all of the vSmart controllers go out it simultaneously, we're in trouble. These things are the routing brain. Um, it's, it's, Imperative to remember that um, it will route based off of the last known routing table update. So if those things were down for hours, it is uh, it is likely that they would uh, no longer have uh, proper visibility of, of of topology changes and things of the like. But that is why we have these built in multiple sites, again, spread across the state data centers and in the clouds. So that way we don't have a scenario uh, unless it's major cataclysmic type events that take down the vSmarts. Uh, they, they can definitely handle the load from one to the other to the other. Uh, the initial build will be able to support 3,000 sites. We don't even have 3,000 sites, so it's going to be good. Um, these, um, uh, these guys are also outside of the communications path of the actual data. Uh, they are out of band. Uh, you know, they, they talk on, the, on that management channel. Uh, you know, with the with the other routers, just like a real route reflector, a real route reflector in MPLS environment is just there to serve routes. It's not there to actually be in the hop count. So it's it's just off to the side doing its thing. Again, it's looking at the road from up above, right? Telling us what the what the roadways all look like, like the the cool red lines on the Google on the Google map at five o'clock. Um, they build the adjacencies between the edge routers. Um, using uh, standard IPsec and IKE protocols, um, and they uh, facilitate that data plane. Uh, but for you to actually see the adjacencies, you have to look in the bidirectional forwarding detection or uh, BFD table in the vManage to actually know if it's working or not. You you can't just log on to this thing and get much uh, information of uh, at all. It's it's not meant to. Again, single touch point. We mean single touch point um, and vManage. So. Uh, all of that stuff, again, everything is done in vManage. Everything is done in vManage. Um, routing policy or security policy changes made in vManage, pushed to the vSmart, felt by the edges, all done in one spot. Even if you're DOL and you have 240 something sites. I like to use you guys as an example. I counted your sites one time. Uh, you're easy to remember. 
<laughs> so anyhow, uh, next server is is called the V bond and is arguably the most important part of the SD WAN system. Uh, this is the binding agent, if you will, that brings all of the pieces of the SD WAN system together. Um, hence the name V bond, right? Um, in our implementation, this device is a, a pair. One lives up in Azure and the other in the SDC. Um, and these, uh, uh, when an edge router uh, begins the initialization process, when we send one out to your remote site, it only knows about the whereabouts of the V-Bond. Uh, V-Bond orchestrates the uh, datagram transport layer security or DTLS tunnel that is needed between the V-Manage, the V-Smarts, the V-Bonds, and the edge devices so that those devices can do what they need to do. So in effect, P the V-Bond is kind of like a project manager. Um, it's probably a junk analogy, but it's the best one I could come up with. Um, V-Bond must be publicly reachable and is DNS resolvable. Uh, so this one, we've got to make sure we're, we are protecting. Um, but using the internet, it, it kind of makes it a, a must because we're not making dedicated private connectivity back to uh, the backside of something and to a, to a server here that's going to resolve stuff internally. This is going to be publicly uh, resolvable because branch site 1234 is just coming from a Comcast IP out in uh, Pullman and so be it, right? It needs to be able to route to the V-Bond. Um, so when a new edge router attempts to come online, it's gonna pull up a DHCP IP address from the front side interface. It's gonna call home to the state's Cisco smart account uh, through a DNS query, and it's gonna resolve our DNS name for these things. Uh, one of them is going to take the request to join the network and from uh, that V edge device, and they're gonna check it against the database of, it's gonna check against those pre-configured templates and those authorized device lists, and uh, it will verify that burned in certificate that's in that TPM module, similar to a burnt in address on a Mac, Mac address on a NIC, right? Um, and it'll take action as appropriate. If it's not pre-configured, again, we're, we're uh, gonna have to manually bring this thing up into the net. Um, and uh, it is this process that ensures that only Washington State devices enter the Washington State SD-WAN fabric. So ideally, the account is updated at ordering time. Uh, the operations team applies the correct feature template to the, and the correct, uh, not just the feature template, but the correct uh, configuration template as well. Um, and once authenticated, uh, VBON pushes that configuration to the remote device. Uh, we test drove this uh, zero touch uh, provisioning aspect of the system during the uh, proof of concept and it performed exactly as advertised. It, it did work exactly like it was broadcasted and it was, it was, it was really cool to see. Uh, process took roughly 20 minutes and the box was up and running. We were able to reach into the edge routers and the v, from the vManage and, uh, and make additional configuration changes in the GUI uh, for the new device uh, to ensure that like your south side peerings to the customer edge routers were up, exchanging routes and ready to process traffic. So in theory, we can mail one of these machines straight to the site and have a random stranger plug it in and bring it up. Um, I don't actually see that happening, especially the uh, stranger part, um, but that is something that the WATEC, uh, that WATEC and the target agency can work out, you know, how we're gonna do the logistics of all of this. Um, if, as long as the person on the other end can read and you know which interface to plug the little DMARC cable into, it should be that easy. Um, it does not have to work that way though. Let's just be for real. Um, there's other ways to do that. So VBond also handles any kind of uh, NAT, NAT traversal and uh, QoS policies that belong to that particular overlay. Uh, once VBond is done with its job, that DTLS tunnel is torn down and uh, it, uh, it stops talking. They don't, it's not a persistent connection. Everything uh, uh, after that is a matter of uh, what we do uh, with vManage. So take for uh, take ex for exa example here, if you lost power at one of your sites and, and you lost your edge device, when it would come back up, it would do the phone home thing. You would go back through the process of talking to the vBond and then all that was brought back up, network reestablished, re it would drop that connection and go back up about its business of waiting for the next new node. So when it comes to NAT traversal, um, I did find some RFCs. There's not a lot of uh, RFC stuff covering SD-WAN and software defined things that I, I find. Uh, so if, if you're interested, um, RFC uh, 5389 uh, explains uh, what STUN server and STUN clients are, S-T-U-N. Um, 
the bond and uh, the remote device when it comes to NAT configurations operate under that uh, uh, standard. So to the V edges, last device uh, type in the system. Um, v edges are the actual routers that will replace the current PE routers out at a field, uh, out the field site and facilitate the peering of our cloud uh, infrastructure of a, as a service segments into the SD-WAN. Right, uh, there will eventually be a lot of these things. Um, just because you don't have a PE router doesn't mean you won't need a a, a, a V edge device at your site. If you're going to make that a, a, a SD WAN capable device, there will be an SD WAN box at that location, uh, which may not be the way your site is deployed today, but uh, it is the only way you're going to get into the fabric. Um, so. Unfortunately, software defined networks still have a lot of hardware in them. Um, name's a little mis, uh, misleading uh, in some ways. So the overlays that we build uh, that will serve as your data plane communicate over IPsec tunnels between each other uh, in a topology defined in the configuration template on the vManage. Um, each overlay is different and uh, one will not influence or limit the other. Um, the VPN number again is going to be your OFM agency code and we'll map those to your MPLS VRF back at the uh, SDC or QDC. So mentioned before, if you're on the SMON, uh, that it's not really where you're going to pick up your stuff from. You're going to get it from the head ends at the SDC. So let's talk about those head ends for a second. Uh, the head end routers are HA pair capable. There are a set of them at both data centers. Uh, and as needed, we'll scale them horizontally um, instead of trying to buy bigger and bigger and bigger boxes, because we could do a 100 gig backbone on these things if we wanted to. They, the price tag goes way up if we do. Uh, right now, there's not a need for that. So we'll scale these guys horizontally. Um, if we get to that point where we need to. Um, they peer via BGP with the south side of the device to the VRF um, and the routers in the existing topology. That's how we get the existing uh, integrated with the new. Um, so uh, if you're, again, an SMON uh, data center uh, or um, sorry, an SMON customer, a, a data center colo uh, customer. You got a BGP peered router sitting in the SDC today, uh, or you might be in the shared services module of the data center. Uh, you'll pick up the SD WAN overlay from these head end devices. Um, again, this is uh, this design principle is critical to the cost avoidance need. Um, if we didn't do this way, the SMON nodes would have to would be replaced by SD WAN nodes, um, which are brand new. It would drive the prices up on un, Unreal un, like. So that 10 gig backbone, 100 gig backbone, I think the new SMON has is going to get you to the to the door where you either go to the right to go out to the legacy network that you already are used to using now, or you go left and you take the hop that connects you to the SD-WAN. So you can still leverage all of the capabilities and the assets that are in your SD-WAN overlay. Uh, you just don't have it sitting at the, say, Cherry Street building if you're HCA. So, um, but again, we can talk about that at another time. Uh, if if there's a, a reason for why you should, you know, it doesn't mean you can't. So, um, as I've already stated, uh, this this stuff is built to optimize traffic flows to the cloud, and it allows us to leverage, like Mike said in the very beginning, cheaper and more flexible transport options. Um, it allows branch offices off of the SMON uh, to get out to the cloud without having to come back to the uh, to Olympia first. Um, and uh, does that mean? Uh, I'm going to pause that. Pause that thought. Never mind. Um, so um, when it comes to the V edges. Uh, the uh, V edge devices, uh, pardon me. I'm sorry, everybody, the, for the delay. Okay, so uh, V edges initiate the startup of the process so that uh, we can leverage that zero touch provisioning function we just mentioned. And uh, uh, those are really nice to have, but they don't have to work, right? It, it is, uh, it's it's cool. It, it saves some time, but it's not like, oh my goodness, the ZTP thing didn't work. Uh, all is lost. 
not 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 even the case. Um, the um, yeah. Anyway, I got myself distracted. Someone rang my doorbell, so forgive me. Um, so, uh, yeah. Okay. Well, the last thing I think it's important to note about the V Edge devices here is since they are meant to replace the PE router at your site, uh, you're going to just simply well, let's talk about it from a practical perspective. You're going to simply just pick up the cable that was connected to the PE and plug you know, that's plugged into your customer device. Now uh, you're just going to plug it into the SD WAN device. I mean that's really the change. Um, so um, you'll form that BGP adjacency or a static route uh, mapping like we do today, and the edge is going to route your traffic into the overlay just like we do with the PE. Um, so if if it's all the same, if it's so similar to the existing system, then why do I care to listen to Andrew talk about this? Uh, that's, a, that's a fair question. So um, each uh, V edge is right sized to each of your site's needs and has uh, WAN connectivity that is managed and analyzed by your controllers. That's not done today. Uh, and the ability to fail over to alternate paths without reconvergence is uh, is definitely definitely sweet. Uh, during the proof of concept, we were able to actually unplug one of the circuits and it didn't drop a packet while it uh, just picked up and started carrying over the other path. Because again, the controllers have already informed the routers of the available roadways. They, they're, they're looking at it from above. Um, they, they know what's best for them and it just kept working. And uh, we actually had to do that test twice because we weren't sure if it actually did, did you, Kevin, did you really unplug the cable? Yeah, he really unplugged the cable. We did it twice just to prove it. everything. Yeah, yes, sir. It, every time. And it was just like, well, I'll be darned. That worked so seamlessly that I couldn't believe it. So, um, and I'm not trying to, you know, blow smoke here. Uh, it's that, that anecdote, it's, it's, that was money. I, I can't, I can't even begin to, you know, exaggerate there. Um, so, Additionally, those V-Edge devices are right-sized uh, with those uh, UTM feature sets factored in already. Uh, this is one of the key points of what the SD-WAN design really is meant to, to leverage on top of that internet connectivity piece. Um, these requirements that we set forth during the proof of concept were to test and validate whether advanced malware protection, next-gen firewalls, URL filtration, uh, IDS, IPS, and zone-based firewall functions are built onto every site. So effectively, we've replicated the security stack of the SDC and the QDC at each location, and it works. So we've still got to walk through and do the whole SDR, uh, the SDR process and all that other jazz with this with the OCS folks because well we got to make sure we're doing things the right way here, but it actually delivered that and it's it's those capabilities that this system offers that our current architecture and those current PEs and that MPLS thing does not do for us today. Um, so um, the idea is that we're able to route you directly to another SD WAN site. And if your headquarters is hanging off the SMON, it's vicariously an SD-WAN site through the SMON, right? And the SDC. And you can permit traffic like your O365 and other stuff to just, you know, go out, out the front door, uh, out, you know, uh, at the site that is appropriate for each location and go to that service uh, because it's already been inspected. It's already uh, been checked against our security policy before it ever hits that northbound wire. Um, hopefully that makes sense. Um, and, uh, to, to me, that's, that's the, that's the, so what, so, um, slight disclaimer here. I mean, we've tested it, but we'll, we'll have better details on our absolute posture and all of that certainty after the pilot's finished. We'll, we'll know for certain. Okay. Yes, this, this, this met our intentions. This has the process. This will be what this looks like going forward. We can wash, rinse, and repeat this because that's the idea, right? Making it as simple as we possibly can to reproduce. All right. So, concept of operations. I've been toying around with the idea of it already, but I'm going to just say it. <laughs> we are planning to primarily use the internet as interconnectivity for the SD WAN. Uh, Mike has said it. I, I, I've been toying with the the words. I've been. That is the intention. Long term, we want to save costs on circuits 
we want to use the internet where possible because it's a lot of tax dollars for all those circuits. Um, it'll, it still won't be, it ain't going to be free. Let's not, let's not kid ourselves, but uh, broadband internet is definitely a cheaper option. So since the pandemic, Mike mentioned this a little bit, um, uh, the, the internet backbone the internet backbone has grown to accommodate the changes to the workforce. Uh, LaTeX in, in, in tandem has done the same thing. We've grown our capacity on the edge as well for the same reason. Um, other aspects of the SD-WAN is that workloads are changing. If we're moving things to the cloud and 90% of my traffic is heading that way, then do I need the biggest, fattest pipes to get back to the SDC? I think not. Um, there may be a transitional period, but uh, if your branch office isn't coming back here anymore to go to Azure, then great. That's less bandwidth we have to account for at the front door. Uh, so let's remember that the SD-WAN is for those agencies that are still maintaining physical office presence um, around the state. Um, there may be some small boards or agencies or little commissions around that have, you know, an office in Seattle someplace and a SSL VPN is fine for them. This isn't for them. That's not, that's got, that's nothing to do with those folks. I need to take a drink of water, excuse me. But, so the short story is, uh, you know, I don't know if uh, that's actually going to uh, do what you need it to do, uh, but, uh, We'll we'll assess that one at a time. So, okay, SD WAN use cases. <clears throat> Here I have pictured just a few of our use cases. Uh, the theme of our connectivity that we're pushing is, uh, you know, internet based, um, and uh, really cloud or not to cloud, prem on not to prem. You know, it doesn't really matter. The the real big piece is, is where are the parts? <clears throat> what are we connecting together? And logically, we, we put them all together with some cool software and all of the, the all the 5W stuff becomes a little less uh, prevalent when you're talking about the pieces that are underlay pieces. Someone else is delivering that path for me, I don't care. Um, it's, it's meant to be that simple. I have a feeling uh, that, uh, uh, We'll still dig probably deeper than we ever need to, but uh, yeah, more information is not a bad thing. Um, so primary SD-WAN driver is, uh, as Watex sees it, is circuit costs. Um, I, I don't think I'm allowed to disclose the price tag, but it is, it's pretty significant. Um, this hardware, I mean, any hardware is always going to come with a price tag, uh, but we can be choosy when it comes to uh, transport provisioning. And we intend to replace as many of those dedicated Ethernet circuits as we possibly can uh, and replace them with a cheaper broadband Internet service, which is a uh, admittedly it's a uh, divergence from what we have been singing in the past. But it's for the it's for the feature sets uh, and the capabilities that these routers and this controller infrastructure bring to the table that has got us changing our tune. Let's just. Be, let's be honest about that. It is it, it changes the the way those things function. Uh, to now, it makes some of that uh, that uh, hardline approach maybe a little less uh, less uh, uh, consideration, I guess. Let me just say it that way. So um, we still have to, like I mentioned a minute ago, we still have to be deliberate in the process here uh, and and making sure that the the solution is the right solution for a particular location, and we've got to account for upload and download downlink speed requirements. We've got to make sure that it's available. It's got the capacity you need, uh, the location it's available. I mean, you know, it, it could still come down to you still need to use a dedicated Ethernet circuit. The dedicated Ethernet circuit will, in fact, work with the SD-WAN just fine. Um, it is one of the primary use cases. Um, we tested it during the, uh, the POC where it was our dedicated Ethernet circuits and the add-on of a broadband Internet link. Um, but that doesn't realize the cost savings. You know, if you can under, I mean, everyone can understand that we're adding on another path that's going to cost more money. So it really does. the The primary focus is going to be seeing where we can cut those costs. So, um, so even with uh, a dedicated Ethernet circuit back to the SGN, uh, the overlay is still going to uh, provide that direct routing to uh, a resource in the SD WAN topology. Um, it just has to be re redesigned just a little bit uh, for its connectivity into the state data center. Um, and uh, those designs will be covered at uh, upcoming tech talks. 
So if I have a, what if you have a PGN verf or an IGN verf or an app verf? Okay, so what if you do? Um, if you use one of these specialty routing environments today at a site where a PE delivers that connectivity, so your app verf is sitting off of PE router 2701 in Tacoma, um, so be it. It can be an overlay too. It's not a big deal. It's just a replacement for a virtual network topology. And uh, when the smoke clears, it'll all work fundamentally the same. It's just been automated. It's been relegated to a singular device where one dashboard controls it all. And uh, that is uh, that is that is money in the bank to me. Um, these are just virtual networks in a physical place. And SD-WAN connects virtual networks in physical places. That's what it does. All right. So another picture. I like this one. Um, <laughs> the uh, the diagram here is kind of showing you a long term high level design of of the integration between the SD WAN, which is on the left side of the red data data dashed line there, uh, and the existing uh, legacy topologies today um, on on the right. So you can see at the top there it says SD WAN encapsulated traffic and uh, you know on premise traffic unencapsulated and that's got a little asterisk there because your traffic may be encapsulated because you're using HTTPS or TLS or some other secure protocol to encap to encrypt it. I don't mean completely raw traffic. It's just it's not SD WAN encapsulated. Just to set the set the record straight there. So uh, today, nearly all of our networks backhaul to the state data centers over dedicated Ethernet circuits, and they form a private WAN. Um, this allows for the consumption of the state security stack and standardizes the approach um, on the, the security doorway for all agencies. Regardless of how you feel about it, this model has served the purpose it was intended for. Uh, but with cloud, it's becoming clear that this design doesn't really work going forward. Um, so as we grow the SD-WAN, what you're going to see here is more and more of the systems that look like what they would look like on the right move over to the left side. And what you see here, oh, goodness, there goes my, my picture again. Um, darn wheel. Um, so we've got a, a, a routing table environment, a DMZ effectively, that we plan on any dedicated Ethernet circuits that remain in the system. They would migrate out of your agency VRF, which is an internal connection today, and they would drop into the SD-WAN uh, edge VRF instead. And what that allows to happen is the overlay forms from the front side interface of this uh, head end router here, and it makes those dotted line connections to the other gray routers as appropriate. Um, so what we have to have is a common transport to, to a reachable transport. If we left the circuit in the backside, the overlay would try to create out the back door, and that's not what we want it to do. So those circuits that do remain hard, fast, you know, critical sites for DSHS, for example, the circuit may still physically terminate uh, into the SDC uh, the way that it does today, but it's going to be in a different routing environment. So that way we can build those logical uh, overlays to, to them. And then they could have a cellular link off of the side there. Uh, just got to make sure that the antenna is in a good spot. And in this case, you see the use case I mentioned a minute ago where we'll have two, two different overlays, two different agencies at one location. I can think right away of State Patrol and DOL has an office out in Spanaway or somewhere out that way off like 112th Street or something like that. Saw that driving by a couple of weeks ago and I said, oh man, they'd be a great candidate site, but be rest assured, uh, I don't think we've approached you guys for that. So uh, just using them as an example. And then this will be likely what the majority of the system looks like in the in the real picture. Uh, lots and lots of, of SD-WAN sites deployed you know, just using this this connection to Comcast or or CenturyLink or whoever to get into the internet backbone at large. And what um is important to note here, and and we mentioned earlier, is that the cellular link stuff here. Uh, this is not an augmentation of the state's. Uh, telephony services uh, catalog just to just to be clear this is <clears throat> just like your cell phone can attach uh, to a tower and talk to google 
So do these, except these are carrying those DTLS and those IPsec tunnels for backbone communications instead. So it's uh, this is uh, could it be the doorway doing a Google search if you allowed it to be by policy? Sure, but uh, these are these are not facilitating phone calls. There's no session border controllers in here that are helping you along the way. There's no phone dialing that's happening, at least on the side that we see. Uh, now, what happens inside of Verizon's network or AT and T? I don't, I don't care, because I just need it to get to the internet, which we all understand how the cell phone works. Well, we want to be able to leverage that as a as a transport mechanism. And I think I there we go. So um, I've said it already, but I'm gonna say it again. Uh, I've been in networking now for a pretty long time, and uh, I've never actually seen an easy button. So while SD WAN simplifies operations, it is it still requires thoughtful planning and coordination to avoid problems. Um, the uh, the same network protocols and and technologies, you know, like BGP and and other things, that's still there. Um, plus, there's some extra parts that live in the background, so it's it's not wise to uh, uh, underestimate uh, or uh, oversimplify these planning factors. We still need to think through this and make sure that we've we've uh, checked all the blocks before we pull the plug on something and try to migrate it over to a new one. Um, but that automating process, that uh, that. Uh, Aligning that edge device with a with a with a response to a call home through a DNS query that's really still pretty cool compared to uh, what it normally takes and the amount of time that it takes because in theory too the internet is provisionable in a couple of hours versus the ordering time for a long haul circuit. I mean I've seen them take a year to get a circuit delivered. I mean that's that's a long time. Uh, in theory, we don't have to wait that long to get broadband internet delivered to a site. Again, based on availability. So, um, key aspect of SD WAN is the agnostic nature of the transport, and that's what this picture is here really trying to represent. That it could be any kind of communications. I've got satellite transport on there just because it comes up. Could it be Starlink um, or, or the that Elon Musk service, whatever it's called? I don't see why not. We don't have a purchasing mechanism for that that I'm aware of. So, um, it's there as a as a thought process for the future. But really, it's there to kind of in indicate to you the how much I don't care about the transport piece. I just need the lights to come on when I plug in a Cat5 cable or a fiber to the jack that's on my on my SD WAN node, and it's all over after that. That's that's really what it's supposed to be. So, um, really, being able to trade the contracted expensive circuits for a cheaper service is the key to the success for this effort. So uh, my migrating away uh, from all those circuits is going to realize millions of dollars in cost savings, and effectively it pays for the SD-WAN. Uh, so to be clear, there's no responsible, uh, or I'm sorry, not responsible, but reasonable expectation that the budget has extra money in it. Um, but what you have is a, an enhanced capability um, with cloud optimized routing, improved performance and visibility, and with no real additional costs. Um, that's that's the goal. So in theory, one hand hair washes the other. Um, as Mike mentioned earlier, uh, the transition goal here is uh, 82 sites a year. Um, once that pilot is concluded, um, that is the number we came to that figured out if we can convert this many sites over the course of the next several years, this is our break even point or our, uh, our stay in the black point. And uh, that, that's, we're really going to try to stick to that. Um, so, uh, and just also to please remember that this is the concept of operations. And as we learn and grow with the introduction of, of, of the tech and, and processes and, 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 and new feature enhancements of over, over time, uh, there's bound to be some adjustments and tuning that goes on with this. So uh, once, as I speak of this, it's, uh, it's not like carved in stone. Um, so, um, and one of the other business drivers too was the the life cycle of RPE routers. So there's there's hundreds of those, and uh, we we've got to get those out of here. So the the timing for this is really important because those contracts go into expiration. The PE routers uh, will eventually start to hit life uh, end of life uh, notifications, and we we want to try to hit those sites up in, in the order in which those events happen. So that's kind of the the principle behind a, the way we're thinking through this. Um, and uh, and one of the important parts about that with that life cycle is if a 
site is a multi-verf site, a multi-tenant site. So I've got a DSHS routing table and the IGN and the whatever at that one site. All of them have to convert at the same time. But here's the cool thing. This is a site by site by site uh, modernization. This is not a DSHS modernization at the same time. We're not going to take 245 DOL sites and do it all in one hit. We're going to do them one at a time as appropriate because they can coexist. So there's no, no expectation that you guys have to be ready to have your entire topology migrated to SD-WAN tomorrow or, or even next year. Uh, it's, it's, that's just not how this will go. Uh, so hopefully that gives you a, a sense of relief. Um, it certainly would if I were in your shoes. Um, well, I guess I'm telling you how to feel. It's not my intention. But, <laughs> but uh, anyway, that is uh, – it, it, but, but each site has to convert together. Let's, uh, and I'll leave it at that. And then uh, on, on to the next slide here. So um, again, I'm reiterating at the top of the, the top five bullets here, those are reiterating some of those security principles and some of the ownership and the responsibilities uh, paradigm that we're talk I was talking about. And the bottom three bullets is really what I want to focus on here. I suppose if I were doing bottom line up front, I should have put them at the top. But, uh, you know, my, my boss can scold me later. Um, um, the uh, The... The internet uh, does does not support jumbo frames. Okay, I think we all know that. If you don't know that, now you do. All right, 1500 is the MTU size on the internet. So that is going to be a thing that we have to make sure that we talk about. So um, it could be the thing that says, "Yep, that's unacceptable for me." Maybe, maybe not. Uh, we'll we'll see. But as we modernize our 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 devices, as we modernize our networks, as we modernize our workloads and our apps for the cloud, uh, we need to make sure that that stuff is accounted for in those plans too. Um, and and news newsflash for everybody. Um, Microsoft doesn't support jumbo frames either. So when we go to you know deliver a thing over the cloud highway, you're not getting more than 1,500 there either. So the 1500 MTU thing is a concern, but I think it's a lower lower concern. It, it's one of those uh, those traits of the internet that we've all come accustomed to talking about. Uh, there are mechanisms in modern systems for accommodating some of those things, and it's still not suffering from fragmented packets. And we'll want to make sure that when we get ready to modernize a site, that we understand what those mechanisms are, so that way uh, we've accounted for all of those requirements because you could have an application that could be completely botched by this um, if that were the case. So we want to make sure that we do our homework up front. Again, deliberate planning uh, is still required. Um, so really what I wouldn't suggest here is trying to push iSCSI you know, rights over, over the WAN, but I wouldn't recommend you do that now. Right. Um, so what you want to make sure of is that your, your cloud application and your uh, uh, SQL database that it attaches to on the backside, they probably should be in the same place or relatively, if they're going to be cloud-based, why don't you put them in the cloud so we don't have to worry about that, right? Those are some of those planning factors we can think of. So um, also the internet is more latent. We all know that it's uh, it's a characteristic of, uh, of cloud VPNs and branch office VPNs. It is just what it is. Um, one of the things I think I would uh, factor in here is in the state of Washington, most of our workloads remain in Washington. So the latency theoretically will remain pretty low because to get to the middle of the country, it's still only about 40 milliseconds. So here within the state, you can you can expect lower latency. I can't give you an exact number because it varies on the path, right? Uh, and I'm not going to sell you five, nine capabilities to of someone else's system. Um, that's That's a... I would, I think I'd get terminated for that. Um, <laughs> so, um, but what we can do to account for that is those functions of of uh, that those role based access control things I was talking about earlier, where you can tune and tweak and prioritize your traffic. As as noted, you could potentially load share across your second path. Some of my traffic goes this way. My less important traffic goes that way. You have the ability with SD WAN to make those kinds of decisions where you can't do that today. So that's that's an important aspect as well. Uh, so you can you know make sure that your GIS app is not getting trumped by your Netflix traffic, right? Um, or YouTube. I mean, if we want to do some training, right? Um, 
So um, the win here is that we can get internet service from just about anyone, anywhere, and it's going to cut. It's going to cut the costs. Um, and uh, you know, another thing about those Ethernet links too, I forgot to mention, is they go where they go, right? If something happens to it in the middle, well, it's down and that's it, right? We've we've all experienced that uh, here. Um, well, doesn't that apply to the internet too? Eh, it might, uh, depending on where the problem exists. If the backhoe is in your front yard, I suppose you're probably out of luck. Um, but if you've got a radio link over an LTE connection, then you uh, could potentially have almost seamless response to that backhoe, right? Um, those are some serious planning considerations for the uh, metro-situated uh locations right obviously that's not going to work out in the out in the hills uh and up in the mountains for some remote ranger station they likely don't have 5g capability but uh that will not always be the case um but in the meantime you know these are these are planning things to think through and and, and ways to 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 figure out how to overcome some of the limitations that we understand the internet to have so um the uh, the system's knowledge of that whole environment is what is making the path choice easy, right? Because the controller is figuring out, okay, here's my cellular path, there's my other cellular path, or here's my primary uh, broadband path, there's my alternate cellular path, whatever. I, I don't have to worry about a dead timer, hold timer, dropped keep alive messages, whatever those are. And then the trigger moment that comes with forcing reconvergence on a network, I just use that other path. And I'd be willing to bet that in Seattle, you might find that the 5G path would be potentially your preferred path um, because they have a robust uh, footprint. It's, it, it, and I would, I would argue that we probably should just let vManage figure that out for us because it's got the means to know better than I do. So um, what we really can do is optimize uh, path selection, we can increase our survivability and we can reduce the costs and um, reduce a bunch of common choke points. Um, and now with all that said, you know, because I've been selling this thing to you, I've been trying to talk it up, right? Um, will the SD-WAN be up 100% of the time, all the time, every single day, all the time? Uh, I'm not saying that publicly. Um, <laughs> but what we should see is a system that is much better, that, that allows us much better use of our time and our resources. Um, uh, but I'd be, I, I, I'm, I'd be pretty, pretty willing to, to, to stake some pretty good uptime on it though. I'm not ever going to say something will be up a hundred percent though. All right. So last thing on this slide, um, again, it's, uh, that cellular thing, again, not a augmentation of our telephony services just so we all know it's not going to help me process my team's meetings it's 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 just going to carry it as a data path it doesn't care that it's a phone call so um and uh again we'll let we'll let the v manage figure out what the right answer is for what that traffic flow looks like so um a couple final thoughts here i'm getting close to the end of my presentation and um you, uh, you, you folks may recall that uh, LaTeX doesn't do very much for you in the way of traffic shaping in QoS, right? We don't do MPLS traffic engineering and stuff like that. Uh, we don't intend to. Here is where we intend to deliver the administrative rights to your overlay so you can determine the proper path for your business applications. I mean, how, how would we know what is right for you? We wouldn't. We're too far removed. Um, but here we can deploy a multi-tenant solution for the state and let you have a little bit of say-so in how it's done and what it does for you. So as we wrap up the pilot and, and finalize all of the background work I mentioned a little, a little while ago, we'll approach you with a questionnaire um, for your site survey related topics. Uh, this way we can ensure that the right size deployment is not just a fairy tale I mentioned in this slide presentation, but we can actually make it come to life. And then, so, Last point of this is what's next. So again, we're working on procurement right now. Uh, we've got uh, the, uh, I forget what BOM stands for all of a sudden. We got the BOM in place, um, bill of materials, there we go. <laughs> we got a bill of materials, uh, 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 statements of work are being finalized with our with our vendors. And uh, we're getting ready to start deploying the, uh, the heart of the system, those controllers into Azure and the SDC. Um, 
the uh, the plan has us building that base infrastructure needed to get those controllers and, and systems functional. Um, and uh, we're currently coordinating with those pilot agencies. So if you're not in the know about this, it's likely not you. Um, and our timeline is midsummer for the pilot install and testing. And like Mike said, uh, if everything goes well, we'll have a, a solid uh, answer on how we start rolling this thing out uh, by the end of the calendar year. And then this is my last slide. Um, so remember, SD-WAN optimizes those cloud workloads by allowing uh, connections to route directly and as securely as possible. Um, it improves system performance and customer experience by leveraging cloud-based resources. Um, SD-WAN tech will pay for itself as state agencies adopt broadband connectivity and cloud services. Um, at least that's what the math says. And uh, uh, SD-WAN aligns with our state and uh, uh, and WATEC strategic initiatives uh, and uh, and the uh, the alignment of um, technology, uh, the industry, the technology uh, sector. I'm sorry, I'm getting tongue tied. And then uh, lastly, SD-WAN is uh, the direction that WATEC is considering uh, as uh, the state's IT provider of choice. And I lied. This is the last slide. <laughs> so. That was uh, that was my presentation. I hope you guys found it useful and uh, I'll stick around for a few and answer questions if you have them. Well, let me piggyback a little bit um, before uh, an onslaught of questions may come up, but um, just just to be clear. So what we what Watek intends right is we have several communication pathways or avenues to pass on information to to agencies um, there's the cio forum which we pass information network services division hosts a semi-annual uh, event where we it's called the customer engagement meeting where we bring in agencies every six months uh to a virtual room and we tell them what's going on right uh, and then the third avenue for specifically for SD-WAN will be these tech talks. Um, so we're looking at another tech talk here in about three months. We're going to do one a quarter is the goal. Um, so there's, you know, what I'm, and I say that because I know that people have questions. They go, what if, what if, what if, right? Don't play the what if game because we may not have the answers uh, because we're, we're, in a pilot so we've done a proof of concept we know that the technology works right that's what we've confirmed now we've got to put it into production and with five sites um you know to isolate that to find out if it's going to work and how it's going to work and then uh the additional capabilities that come with it so um you know for those that have your questions feel free to send them to me you could put them in this uh you could you could drop them in here as well uh but but don't be surprised if we say that's a good question. We'll get back to you because I said, you know, all the questions that have come up here, they're good questions. Um, but we also don't want to say, you know, we think this and then turn around later and we and we're wrong. Right. So we'd rather tell you the truth and have that truth uh, confirmed and verified um, because that helps with your guys's plan. All the you know how agencies plan. Uh, second is that we are also we're going to be working with our EDN WAN team. Uh, the, the SD-WAN project team, that is, uh, to look at how um, the timeline of circuits, right? So, you know, circuits, we they, they life cycle every five years, typically. Um, and we've got some circuits coming up here in late 23, 24, even 25 that we're going to be looking at and going, okay, are these candidates for SD-WAN, right? And that's going to generate, the, you know, to help us generate our uh, exploratory uh, line of questioning so that when we meet with an agency that we think, hey, you guys have some sites, by the way, DOL, you're coming, right, uh, is to say, hey, we think, you know, these circuits are coming up for renewal here in 2024. They'd be great candidates for SD-WAN, right? Let's talk about your traffic flows. So as part of that consultancy gig that is going to help us put together a, a script of questions, right, questions that we ask state agencies to determine which sites um would be candidates for SD WAN. So um that's that's you know that's what we're 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 looking we're gonna get that consultancy help, right? Um so yeah so other than that uh Andrew I know that uh you're you're a chatty Kathy anyway but I want to say you did a great job. Um I want to thank my give my team public recognition for um you know 
getting through these questions. I see even the boss got involved, so Caesar must be bored. Um, so thanks, boss, for helping out there. Uh, but like I said, once this um, once this uh, video renders, I'll make sure I do as normal. I do a reply all, send out the link. Uh, so that everybody can review this again. I would encourage you, if you didn't attend episode one, right, um, I, I would go back and, and really dive into that, learn what SD-WAN is, uh, because it's benefiting, it's going to benefit both Watech and state government. Um, the use cases that um, that, were, have, that Andrew covered as, in this tech talk, and as well as previous ones, Right is hey we need to go straight to the the cloud. Yep, we hear you. Hey, we want to go directly from our site to another site. Yep, we hear you. Right. Hey, and it needs to be encrypted because we align with the zero trust model. Hey, we hear you. Right. So we've heard you, um, and this is our effort to to say hey we've got a solution. Now we just got to get the time to make sure it works um, because you know I don't think you want us to deploy a solution that don't work. Right. That's not fully vetted in production. Uh, because then your customers are coming after you and then you're coming after us, right? That's that third order effect we don't want to do. We don't want to have that. Um, so uh, special thanks to the team that put this all together. Uh, pending any questions, I'll give it a 15, you know, 10, I'll let's go 10 seconds of awkward silence. Of course, the boss raises his hand. Caesar. That was a mistake, I swear. <laughs> oh, okay. okay. So pending any other questions, I'll give it 10 seconds of silence. Okay. Thank you, everybody. Enjoy your day. Um, have a great SD-WAN day, and we'll see everybody uh, virtually later. Thank Terrible. you. <laughs> Take care. I had to, right? I know it. <laughs> I couldn't resist it. <laughs> Great job, PND. Great job, NSD. Thanks for coming. Good job, everybody. Is the recording stopped? Uh, I don't know. <laughs>